Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Howard Rubenstein, who is the president of Rubenstein Associates and who is the number one public relations man in New York City and has been for uh, over 45 years. Last year, he had a party and uh, 3,000 people show up. And he has been the friend of every mayor uh, since he started and uh, every governor. And his clients include Rupert Murdoch, Leona Helmsley, and practically everybody in New York City. In fact, uh, his record is, uh, is incredible to most people because whenever there's a problem, he seems to uh, represent both sides. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, lawyers certainly <laughs> couldn't get away with it. But uh, uh, Howard not only uh, has been uh, doing it, but has earned the respect of everyone with whom he deal deals, and uh, therefore it's a pleasure to welcome him here. Well, thanks, Herman. Yeah. Uh, you and I have been friends for all those years, too. That's right, you sound like my public relations well, person you know, right now. It would be <laughs> unlikely that I, we wouldn't have been uh, friends because you, you deal with everyone who is involved with anything in New York City, but uh, you have been especially helpful to us at the City University. And Thank you, you are in charge of a committee in public relations, and you helped me to establish the Business Leadership Council which includes some of the most important uh, uh, businessmen in the city and is headed by Lou Rudin. But before we get to that, yes. uh, you have, when we first talked, you told me that you have watched what's been going on at the City University over the years. So tell me, what did you find was the image of the City University, say, five years ago, ten years well, ago? Well, let me go back even further than that. When Thanks. I was a kid growing up, going into uh, the college era, um, City University was wonderful. Um, City you, College, you, you for example. You come from Brooklyn, right? I come from Brooklyn. Right. My uh, sister went to Brooklyn College. Right. Uh, if you had a City College degree, they equated it with Harvard. It was the poor man's Harvard. Mm -hmm. And all of the other schools, the Brooklyn College included, um, had that reputation. Uh, then over the years, uh, it declined, uh, sadly declined. And um, it was until recently uh, all with your administration and the appointment of the chancellor, that there was a dramatic comeback in the reputation Tell of the Tell me about University. the years when it declined, uh, because you had told me that you talked to business leaders and they yes. were not as enthusiastic about the City University not as at they all. had been in the old days. Not at all. Uh, take my business, for example. We hire all the time. Um, and we would, we would interview youngsters coming out of City University, and very often they couldn't read and they couldn't write, they were inarticulate, uh, they weren't taking full advantage of what they had. Um, and um, after a while, the business community was turning away from it. We were looking elsewhere for our employees. Um, probably the thing that uh, started the image decline was the open enrollment, where it was assumed by the business community that you dropped your standards just in order to get more students in. Um, and then you change that. Uh, the remediation that you gave uh, in the four-year colleges was um, eliminated and put into the, uh, uh, into the two-year colleges. And you did another very dramatic thing. You started working with the public school system from ninth grade on. Yes, you see, the problem wasn't uh, only with us. The standards, it turns out, were lowered uh, not just at the city university, but they were lowered in elementary and secondary school uh, under a theory known as social promotion, so that everybody got promoted automatically because they got to be a year older. Well, that was an abject failure, and you yeah. recognized it. Yeah. And um, what's so interesting is when you organize the, uh, this business council of advisors to you, uh, the quality of people that wanted to join and to help it, Bob Cattell from Keyspan, and Richard Silverman from Fleet Bank, Lou Rudin certainly, um, Alaire Townsend, who uh, is the publisher of Crane's New York Business. People like that joined and are giving a tremendous amount of time. We all think you're on the right track. Well, what I tell the, uh, the students uh, and the professors is that the fact that the business people that you mentioned and many others uh, are part of a business leadership council indicates that they are willing to hire and they want to hire the graduates of the City University, because the whole idea of having the students go to the City University is to 
be involved in the jobs that exist. You and bet. To participate in the life of the city. And so do I, and so does my business, and we're delighted to see what you've been doing. Uh, I recall when uh, Mayor Giuliani appointed Benno Schmidt to do that report, uh, and then you were subsequently appointed chairman, and Benno Sch uh, Schmidt is vice chairman, I believe. Um, you followed that report, and yeah. with the help of the mayor and the governor, you made a dramatic turnaround for City University. Nobody thought that you could do it in such a short well, time. Well, we, st we still have a ways to go because um, we want to improve uh, all of the colleges, and we're looking for college presidents at Hunter College and at uh, City College and Queens College, and uh, we want to get the uh, best quality people well, you've, that you've, we can find. Yes, and you've put on five new presidents, if I'm correct yeah. on that, and all of them have had a dramatic impact uh, on City University and the individual colleges. Now, how many employees do you have in your firm now? I have 200 employees. That's terrific. I started in Brooklyn on my mother's kitchen table yeah. in Bensonhurst I, yeah. 46 did, years ago. How did you manage to work up to where you are now, uh, high on top of uh, well, Sixth Avenue? thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, well, for a number of years, I uh, had an office at 26 Court Street. I had one employee and then mm -hmm. two employees, and I primarily looked to the nonprofit field um, to represent hospitals and um, Home for the Aged was my very first account. Um, it grew a little at a time, and you had to be very patient. When I started, public relations really wasn't looked at with uh, great regard. They would call us flax, and uh, they would dismiss all of us, uh, but I stuck to it. Uh, my parents had a big influence. My father was a journalist with the New York Herald Tribune. He was a crime reporter in Brooklyn, and he encouraged me, and so did uh, my mother. I eventually went to law school at night, to St. John's Law School. That's, uh, that, that's what I always thought it was interesting, that you were a lawyer uh, who chose not to practice law. Well, I didn't like the practice of law. For a mm -hmm. brief while, I was assistant counsel to the House Judiciary Committee, but I preferred public relations. I preferred being an advocate that way. And it worked. I think I've been very lucky. But there were some ground rules that I set. First, I knew that education was important. That's why I went back to law school. I knew I probably wouldn't practice, but I needed something more. And that's why I encouraged the youngsters going to City University, stick to it. Uh, we hire people with uh, various backgrounds in education. Uh, they are, some of them study to be public relations people. Others are history majors, others are sociology majors, or economics major. I was an economics major and ended up in public relations. Anything that they can learn now will serve them well in my field and in all the fields that we represent. Well, the, what I, I think and, and, and what the people who are watching are interested in is that public relations people, you say, uh, were not highly regarded in the old days. Well, right. they're not highly regarded now either because everybody talks about spin doctors, right. especially now with uh, all the cable channels. Right. Uh, the people who are in the field of uh, public relations and the lawyers are regarded as people who cut a uh, piece of the truth out and try to spin things uh, only on behalf of your uh, clients. But you manage to uh, get a great reputation without being accused of that. How did um, you manage it? I I set a, a ground rule for myself and my staff, and uh, high on the list, top of the list is you have to be ethical. Too many people in my field cut ethics short. They shortchange ethics. Uh, you can't tell a lie. You shouldn't deceive. You can't make up a story. Um, it's really wrong. And that's why when I started, PR people uh, were just terrible. What I saw in my mother, it was odd. For years, my mother introduced me as Howard, the lawyer, after I became a lawyer. She never acknowledged sure, that I was in PR until yeah. much later in my career. Uh, if you're ethical in my field and stick to it, don't bend it, um, you'll be looked at with regard. You have to distinguish yourself from the pack that will say anything and do anything, and that's wrong. Well, the, your field is said by many people to be the field of damage control. Yes. Now, what, if you get a client yes. who has a very uh, difficult and serious problem, what do you advise the client to do with the, with the bad news part of it? Well, first you have to find what the facts are. Some of them won't tell you the facts right off. If they've done something um, seriously wrong, a crime or something like that, then I want to talk to the attorney because I don't want that client, potential client, admitting something to me that he shouldn't. 
but let's assume it's just a very serious problem. How do you deal with it? You, get, you gather the facts and you get it out quickly. You don't resort to a torturous dripping out of the information. That extends the story. Secondly, you, I always ask the question, what's the right thing to do? Not what do you say. I don't look for the spin control on a story. I look to determine uh, what's the right thing to do to correct a bad situation. And I found the public quite forgiving. If you acknowledge you've made a mistake, uh, and you come forward with that, and you say, here's how I'm correcting it, and then you do correct it, that's the best PR, because then the news will follow your actions rather than just what you say. And what do you do if it's good news? How do you deal with that? Oh, then I get it out yeah. right away, even faster. <laughs> well, there are some people who don't want to have any news out because they're worried that that will lead to questions which, which might get them into trouble. Uh, sometimes, but if you have an ethical client and you don't overdo it, if you're, not looking, if you're not driven by ego, let me put it that way, if you're driven by ego and you want your name in the paper every day and you want the columnist to write about you all the time and you want to be on television all the time and you want your social life exposed in the media, that's a bad recipe. I advise my clients, don't look in that direction. Use public relations as an asset, as a tool to advance a business or a cause. Sometimes advancing a cause is very, very important, more than a business. If you don't overdo it, you'll be okay. If you turn on the ego, you turn the ego switch on, and that's how you operate, very big trouble. Now, the, the thing that everyone wonders uh, the most about what you do is, what do you do when you represent both sides of the question? Well, first I disclose it to, yeah, to each yeah, side. Yeah. That happens. We have 500 mm -hmm. clients, so mm -hmm. very often, well, not so often, but from time to time, a client will be, one client will be in conflict with the other. I don't advise either client to start with. I say, well, I represent the other one, and I, and I tell them that. And, and very often they'll say to me, can you help solve it? Can you be a mediator? Can you give an honest opinion that will be somewhere down the middle that will be the right thing to do? And then probably 95% of the time, that's what I do. If one of them says, oh, no, oh, oh you've got to be a warrior and attack the other, I won't do it. I'll just hang back. Well, and so I very rarely lose a client if I hang back. So you need to have uh, some of the qualities of King Solomon, no? Well, that's overdoing it. But I, you, you need patience and you have to be fair. What I ask myself is, what's, what's right? Where is the right and wrong? And then I'll explain it to each client. And they'll say, well, you're fair. You're not, you're not fighting for either one of us. And uh, in most instances, I can bring them to the table and hash out a very tough problem. Sometimes what happens is they're warring with each other over an extended period of time, and then they come to me and say, hey, get us out of this. Mm -hmm. That happens. Good. We'll be back after these announcements. Well, thank you. There are these just two absolutely adorable little kids. They work very closely with my foster grandmother. She's this 83-year-old woman that is able to give them one-on-one -on -one attention. They're different kids and when they walked in in September, they're more sure of themselves. They're so happy and the mom is happy. These little kids have a safe place to go and that they come home excited. It's time to get involved. This is General Colin Powell of America's Promise. Call us and point a kid in the right direction. We're back today with Howard Rubenstein, who is the president of Rubenstein Associates uh, and who is the number one public relations uh, man in the uh, city by agreement uh, uh, of everyone that I've talked to. Uh, now you are the public relations person also for the city university yes, because you are chairman of a committee in our business leadership council on public relations. So uh, what would you advise us to do? I'm asking you now as chairman of the board of the city university. Um, CUNY is reestablishing its reputation very dramatically now. Um, you looked at the minority communities, the uh, African American community and the Latino community, Asian community, um, and really told them that they can compete effectively with the non, uh, with the white community, that uh, they can get a very serious education. Uh, and compete on an equal footing, and you're doing it. And well, well, here's the, the, the problem that I find. There's a fear among many uh, black and Latino leaders and people that if you have very high standards, that somehow 
uh, they will not be able to come up to the same level as the previous immigrants. And I say that they need not fear that, that uh, what we can do at the city university is to provide the opportunity. But if they take advantage of the opportunity, they will be able to compete the same way that other immigrants did. You're absolutely right. I can just see in our hiring, there is no deficit in the black community or the Latino community. They have to reach for those stars. They can't look at themselves as beneath the white community. They're not. They're absolutely not. And when you set the bar of excellence where it is, that's something that they can reach for and achieve. You're doing the right thing. I know the other argument they use is that, well, in the, uh, this is different from the old days because uh, our people have to uh, work and they're older and uh, yes. uh, they, they can't spend their time only going to school. But I point out that I had to work when I went to City College, and I'm sure you and have I to work. And I had to work yeah. all through right. um, law school. So it's not, I went to not law different at all. I went to law school for four years at night, four nights a I week. went at night, and I graduated in three years. Uh, so you're better than which I, is, I which, which is, which is it, very tough. It was hard. Yeah. I, I uh, used to get up at 4 a.m. I still do, by the way. I used I to get up yeah. at 4 a.m. to study. And if you set your mind to it, uh, you can do it. And that's what I tell the minority communities that I deal with. And I'm quite active with 100 black men and the coalition of 100 black women. And they're telling me that um, they see a big advancement in, uh, in City University. And uh, I would tell any youngster of any color, of any race, white, black, Latino, anybody, Asian, reach for those stars and you can do it. And City University is the place that'll give you that opportunity. But start early. Start in the high schools. Start uh, valuing your education. Don't diminish yourself. What an opportunity. Well, now let's say that uh, a young uh, man or woman is uh, sitting on the kitchen table, as you were many years yes. ago, and thinking, uh, well, maybe I should uh, go into public relations. What is the future of that field, and how has it changed or will change in the next uh, 10 years, would you say? Uh, when I started, public relations was a minute field. There were just a handful of agencies, most of them small. Uh, today, communications, mm -hmm. communications are an essential part of every business, of every social movement. Almost anything you see has public relations considerations. And almost every firm has a every public firm. relations department. Uh, right? we, so it's um, really an immense field. Uh, there are tens and tens of thousands of practitioners in public relations with all kinds of background. Uh, the technological advances with the Internet, uh, global communications have made it essential. It's one world now in terms of communications. What you do in New York suddenly is known everywhere in the world. So the demand for a professional, well-trained, is there. Uh, and a youngster graduating from CUNY or, or any school can look at public relations with honor and take a course that will earn them pretty good living uh, and a lot of self-respect and a demand for their services. Now, you've been working with the United Nations on yes. some public relations matters. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, uh, we were retained. Uh, to do the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. That was quite an exciting mm -hmm. time. And uh, there were some negative things involved, but um, New York was the host city, and what a wonderful opportunity for, for us as a public relations firm. I'll give you examples of what public relations can take you to okay. in my work day. Mm -hmm. um, in the morning, I might be doing work for the New York Yankees. I've worked for them for 16 years. Uh, the next call might be from you or City University that they have an issue to uh, tell a story about, about something. At the beginning of the year, we did the ball dropping at Times mm -hmm. Square for the uh, Millennium promotion. Uh, and we did Broadway on Broadway. We do theater work. Um, we have different uh, colleges and universities. We have businesses, major businesses that we're working for. Uh, Rupert Murdoch with his worldwide activity, that's taken me to China. Uh, it's, um, some of my business uh, associates have taken me to Russia. Um, it's a wonderful field. You, you can set your own, your own goal in public relations, but you can never lose sight of the fact you're not a spin doctor. And uh, you spend a lot of time on uh, uh, pro bono activities. You yeah, quite a bit. And yeah. working on some of the real difficult problems that we have in New York City. For example, uh, you got involved in the Crown Heights problem. Yes, I Try was to come to grips with the problems between uh, blacks and Jews. Yes, what I, happened um, there? 
It was, a, as you all know, uh, as you certainly know, it was a very unfortunate confrontation with death involved and charge and countercharge. And for many years, I've been close to the Jewish, Orthodox Jewish community, the Hasidic community, as well as the African American community. So um, I hosted some meetings and then brought the two groups together. And I got them to commit to stop attacking each other verbally because the media, with such an influence, um, will report on a, on a verbal attack on somebody. And before you know it, people are out in the streets following the television demands of either side. So um, the oddity was that I was a spokesperson for both sides. I, know I, um, I actually went to news conferences talking for both the Hasidic community and the African American community. Uh, the then mayor, uh, David Dinkins, asked me to try to intervene and try to help, as did the, as did the Jewish community. Um, what I found is if you um, reached above the conflict at the moment and saw that and, and urged that the police keep a calm uh, situation in the streets and talk to the future of that community that they had to get together just for the sake of their kids, uh, it could work. And it did work. Well, now, we, of course, I say that New York City is not a melting pot as much as it is a boiling pot because sure at any given time, as you know, uh, you wake up and all of a sudden there's a problem. The latest uh, problem that we've had in New York City in terms of uh, uh, ethnic and uh, community tensions is between the police and yes. the communities. How would you deal with that? Um, I think a far greater understanding of each one's problem would be necessary. Uh, what I did is I brought the leaders of the PBA together with the leaders of the 100 black men and 100 black women. Uh, I involved the then cardinal with meetings of both groups. I think they have to have open dialogue where they understand um, what, the, what the needs of each group would be. And I think uh, it involves education. It involves um, the police bringing people from the community into their midst and talking about what they do. It involves the police commissioner and the mayor understanding the problem. While we've had, a, we've had an enormously important drop in crime, I think education can take the next step for ethnic and interracial understanding. The police job is a very tough job. But also, it's very tough to be a minority person and be stopped on the street and frisked for no reason. Yeah. So um, that's very difficult. And I know I wouldn't like it, and I can understand the frustration at both ends. Mm -hmm. a policeman tries to do his job, performs honorably, has cut crime, and a person who's an honorable businessman or, or a community worker suddenly is stopped without cause. There has to be a day when we can look at each other without and be colorblind. And um, that's what I would try to educate the public on. Now, the next. Uh um, area of uh, tensions that we have is in education, where we have problems between the teachers yes. and, uh, and the parents in terms yes. of the uh, fact that uh, some children are not performing. And yes. uh, the teachers end up uh, being blamed, and there are conflicts of this Well, nature. they shouldn't be blamed. Um, there, has to be, there can't be social graduation, social advancement in the school system. Uh, in our public school system and everywhere, you really have to perform in order to be promoted. That's my strong feeling. Uh, we represent the teachers' union for many years. I have to disclose that. And um, my uh, my sister is a teacher, or was a teacher when she uh, when she was active. Um, I respect the teacher and f what the teacher is trying to do. I also know the parent should really thirst for good education for their kids. So um, I'd like to see, as I said with the police and the ethnic communities, I'd like to see the um, teachers and the parents have much greater dialogue. Well, how do we do that? My wife is a teacher, as you yes, know. I have to I know that. that also. I know that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, school by school, there have to be o open meetings where uh, in smaller groups, not in, the, not in large groups where people are screaming at each other and all, have little groups meet in each of the schools and talk about the problems in those particular schools, not citywide. The schools uh, especially where, where the, the low performance is very low. That's right. And then try to encourage the parent participation uh, quite a bit more. It's not up to the teacher totally to educate a kid. 
the, uh, the parent has to take part. You've got to encourage participation and welcome participation of the parent in the upbringing of those children. Well, maybe we should have some more public relations uh, personnel in the uh, police department as well as in the <clears throat> Board of Education. I welcome that. I don't know. <laughs> I think it would be valuable. <laughs> You're talking my language. <laughs> okay, well, we'll need, we'll need then some uh, more graduates who will uh, join the field and get involved in those areas. It would be interesting to take people who are educated in public relations from the minority communities and uh, bring them into the police department and into our educational system. What a plus that would be. Okay. We've, I hope it can be uh, tried and carried out. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.